Okay, good evening folks and welcome to this Mountaineer in Scotland Facebook Live and it's pretty exciting because what this means is we're very shortly heading into winter and uh, I'm getting quite excited about some winter adventures and we know this year has been a little difficult for everybody and um, it's been quite challenging, but getting out into the hills and enjoying the countryside is one thing that we can still all do. So we're kind of expecting the hills to be pretty busy as we head into winter. So it's a great opportunity this evening for you to ask some questions and uh, direct them at the expert panel that we've pulled together. So we're really fortunate this evening to have some experts from different areas in the mountaineering world. So. First of all, I'm Heather, Heather Morning from Mountaineer in Scotland, and uh, we also have the privilege of Kirsty Pallas. Hi, Kirsty, who's join, joining us from the Oban Mountain Rescue Team. Kirsty is uh, an experienced team member. She's been on the team for seven years, and she's also one of the call out managers and a self employed outdoor instructor. Um, we also have Ali, Ali Rose here. Ali's a Fort William based mountaineering instructor and um, spent a lot of time in cold places. So he's a very good person to have on the panel for some winter chat. And he works for Mountaineer in Scotland, funding uh, from St. John Scotland and works with the, the university club. So a really important aspect of our work. Um, and last but not least, and I think it's going to be a very popular man or unpopular, depending on what he's doing with the weather, is Gary Nicholson, one of the forecasters from the Mountain Weather Information Good Service. Evening, everybody. And I've already given him a hard time because the weather's been so <laughs> poor the last few days and it's not looking great for this weekend. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we're, we're hoping Gary can bring out one of those lovely big yellow sunshines that sat over his right hand shoulder at the moment. We, we, were, we were spoiled last weekend, I'm afraid. We used up all the good fortune last weekend with the fog bows and the inversion. You've just got to pay for that now, I'm afraid. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So first question coming in here um, from someone who's completely new to getting out um, in the snow, in the winter on the hill, but they don't want their hill walking to stop just because the snow on the ground. So Ali, perhaps you could give them a wee bit of advice about um, what the essential things to think about would be if you're heading out onto the hill for your first time and there's snow on the ground. Um. Yeah, so the, I guess there's lots of good resources online, obviously on the Mountaineering Scotland website um, and various other websites around. But I would say if you're going to get into winter walking, it might be worth investing in good boots and good gloves, um, good waterproofs. And, uh, and it is worth thinking about the maybe the smaller peaks near the grand peaks that everybody's heard of that often give much better viewpoints to the amazing peaks. So um rather than sort of committing yourself to the big peak straight away and it's obviously worth checking that weather pretty uh, pretty carefully as well yeah and uh, the kit's pretty expensive isn't it ali you know we we recommend people have for example specialist more rigid boots for winter so it, it might be a good option if it's you know trying it for the first time that you actually think about hiring some boots and crampons and ice sacks rather than spend a lot of money when um, you, you don't really know what you're doing and uh, that leads me on to a really nice plug for our courses actually so if you're new to walk in in the winter then um, it'd be a really uh, good option to sign up for a, one of our winter skills course to learn the basics before you you head out out. Um, another question coming in here, and I think this is a good one for you, Kirsty. Um, why do people get into difficulties in winter in the mountains? What would be the sort of biggest reason? I think um, around this time of year, it's the, the change in kind of daylight hours catches a lot of people out. Um, and around this time, you want to start making sure you have things, a couple of extra things in your bag, like a head torch with spare batteries. Um, making sure you know how to use your map and compass and, and have maybe done a little bit of night nav in case you're a bit later than planned um, and just a couple of extra layers because if you are staying out that little bit longer while it's getting dark and it's kind of night it's, it's much cooler at this time of year. 
So I think they're probably the kind of top top things that catch people out. Um, so yeah, back just around this time of year. All right, lovely. Yeah, and uh, and Gary, a first question in for you on the uh, on the weather front. What do you think's the most important thing that people need to look at on your weather forecast? Because you direct it at uh, information for at nine hundred meters, which is where we're interested in. And of the information you give, which do you think is the most uh, popular, or not popular, but the most important bit of information you give out? I think through the winter particularly, it's going to be wind chill um, because that's the thing that really hits home when it comes to having, say, a temperature that's around freezing point, a moderate zero Celsius at 900 metres doesn't seem too bad. If you then add on, let's say, a 30 mile an hour wind, you're very quickly taking that wind chill down to minus 10 and all of a sudden it's getting into a significant territory. Um, so certainly through the winter, you'll, you'll see on the days where the wind is strong enough to have that significant effect. I think that wind chill factor is the key. I mean, we, our forecasts are, are geared that wind is the top thing you see because it's the wind that really does hit home to people on the hills. But the wind chill factor, I think, for winter walking is really one that starts to make things critical. Um, yeah. For, okay. for the, for the most severe conditions, certainly. Once we're getting down to wind chills, as we can get, that can go into the minus 15s, minus 20s. It's, that happens most winters in Scotland. I think the worst we had in the beast from the east, so-called, a couple of years ago in March, we were down not far off a minus 30 wind chill on Cairngorm Summit. We had an air temperature about minus 8 and a 50 mile an hour wind. So, um, yeah, that's about as extreme as it gets. That's not all the time, but, uh, yeah, wind chill, I would say. And if you're in the know, like you obviously are, Gary, being a very uh, meteorological expert, have I got that word right? Then wind chill is, is the language that, that we use every day. But uh, a lot of folk might not really understand what, what wind chill is. Can you just explain to us that what wind chill actually means? It's, well, it's where you're just in direct exposure. Um, it's the, it's the add-on or the take-off, I suppose, temperature from the air, the absolute air temperature that you would record in calm conditions. Um, there's various, I mean, we've got a, a, a grid table basically as a, as a guidance that we will use. Um, I think it appears on the MWIS website somewhere. Um, if not, we'll get it there for the start of the winter. Um, it's just like a great big, you read off temperature and then wind speed and you sort of get a, a value that is the wind chill. It's what it really feels like. If you were directly exposed, if you're behind a rock and hiding from the wind, you'll feel like zero. If you're suddenly being hit completely with that wind in your face, it's what the real feel temperature is right on, on any exposed skin. And that's, uh, it's the feel like temperature, temperature as they often show you on TV when they um, simplify it a little bit. So it's what, it's what it really feels like with the wind Added on, added on or taken away in, in temperature terms. That's good. The, the real feel temperature. I like that because it's easy for me to remember. And um, one for you, I think, Ali, come in here that uh, we've just put out a, a press release today suggesting that not only should you have a head torch with you, you should have a, a spare head torch instead of carrying spare batteries. And someone's wondering why that is, because let's face it, head torches are pretty expensive, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they are expensive. Uh, personally, I have a, I carry a very small, uh, the kind of smallest head torch they make, and I carry that in my first aid kit. And my first aid kit is sealed against water and everything as well. So um, I guess the big difference being that there is other things except batteries that can go wrong with head torches. And you don't want to have to change the batteries and then realize that actually something else is not working, it's got wet or the bulb's gone or whatever. Um, so personally, I feel it's a little bit safer to have a second head torch. Um, and I do know people have a second head torch and carry spare batteries. So you, it depends how, how many options you really want there. Um, yeah. Lovely, yeah, thank you for that. Some good advice and uh, questioning from Pauline and she's asking uh, yourself, Gary, I only called you Jeff then. I, knew, I know I'm gonna <laughs> do that tonight. Uh, but what wind speed would you not advise going on the hill? And of course, we talk in miles an hour, don't we, yeah. on the forecast, even though we talk in kilometres an hour on the maps. But what wind speed would we not advise Pauline to go out on the hill? And, and what would you advise if you get caught? And maybe that's one for Kirsty. 
Um, in terms of wind speed itself, I mean, it's almost how long is a piece of string in terms of what you're prepared to put up with in some respects. Um, I mean, you'll see if you see the MWIS forecast every day, we give the speed and then we give the effect of the wind on you. And once we start to scale up those words into considerable buffeting or arduous walking or difficult walking, we start to get to difficult walking once you sort of 40, 50 miles per hour. So a, a good gale force wind. Um, I mean, you, it's quite common that, that people will be up on the hills in a 25 miles an hour wind and say, oh, that was a very windy day. That was uh, tough going, but it was nothing. So you don't want to know what it would be like at 50 in that respect. But I think once you're getting to what would be a genuine gale, which is about 40 miles per hour, um, you're starting to become difficult. And, and really, once you're getting into a, a severe gale day, 50, 60 miles per hour, you, you'd really want to be avoiding that unless you're very experienced and, and kitted out for that. So uh, yeah, one, once you're getting above 30, 40, it's starting to become rather unpleasant, I would say. And Kirsty, have you got something you want to add to that? Because I'm sure you've been out in some pretty gnarly, windy conditions in your uh, mountain rescue role. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I guess most of the time, like a high wind isn't completely unexpected. You know, it might be more than forecast, but it's there's going to be a forecast of, of high-ish winds. So maybe planning your day around that, thinking about doing a slightly smaller hill or a shorter walk. And or if you do plan a bigger day, making sure you have ways you can shorten it. If once you get up high, the conditions kind of kick off a little bit. Yeah. So just being flexible with your options. And a really nice top tip, you know, if it's going to be sort of 40, 50 miles of power up high, make sure that you do your circuit on the mountain with the wind behind you. So the wind's actually blowing you along rather than you fighting into it. And um, I knew weather was going to be popular tonight. There's a question here for Duncan, quite a technical question. Is it true, Gary, that there needs at least 300 metres of cloud thickness above you before rain can occur? Um, that's a technical one. That sounds like sort of almost uh, the old, old wives' tale sort of thing. I, I, it, it, that, I suppose it depends how heavy you want the rain to be, because even last weekend when there was fairly thin layers of fog, that can produce gentle drizzle and precipitation, which can maybe only be a, uh, you know, a couple of hundred metres of depth. So it's... Uh, not an easy one to answer because you can deal with cloud at so many different levels normally that um, for, for very heavy rain naturally you need a great depth of cloud but I, I would I would say for that yeah you probably do need a good couple of hundred meters because other than that it's just fog and it's just mist banks of mist but if you walk into fog naturally you start to get wet if there's bits of misty drizzle just just around that so um, I'd say that's a bit of an awkward one as to whether that's genuinely true or not but yeah you'd certainly want a, a thick cloud deck to produce proper meaningful rain rather than just a few spits and spots okay good stuff and and just another little point from pauline um ali maybe this this would be good for you to answer if it gets too cloudy to see should you stay still until it passes even if you have to camp out overnight uh i mean i think if you've got camping stuff with you, well, actually, no, it's probably a bad idea anyway. Um, I think keeping moving and knowing how to navigate in any conditions would be the main thing. Um, I was about to say, if you had overnight stuff, you know, you could uh, choose to camp somewhere a bit earlier, perhaps, if you were worried about the weather. But in general, you do want to try and keep moving. I think if you waited for the cloud to clear in Scotland, you might have to wait quite a long time sometimes yeah I, I think you might well have to wait a very long time yeah I, I would always advise keep moving and get yourself off the hill for sure and uh Kirsty Mountain Rescue David uh, has said you've been pretty busy and I know some teams particularly the ones close to the central belt have been have their busiest season ever since we came out yeah. of lockdown um so it's been busy through the summer with new um new walkers on the hills and uh what, what would advice would you give to people if if people are sort of new to it, this sort of, you know, post lockdown, but they're going to continue into the winter when the when the snow's on the ground? Just maybe a couple of top tips. What, what, what would you point people in the direction of? Um, I think for for getting into winter, the easiest and best way to do it is to get on a winter skills course um, and just just learn kind of the basic skills. Um, it's a great way of 
taking the steps to become an independent in winter. Um, other options are some clubs might um, have winter days out where there's, you can go out with more experienced members, but obviously you need to check with those clubs. Um, and just trying to, there's a lot of information online, reading up like on the um, Man Weather Information Service website, um, the stuff on the Scottish Avalanche Information Service website about conditions and, and how to judge that kind of thing as well. Um, but yeah, I think a winter skills course is, is kind of the best way to get Yeah, into and you know, there is a lot of good information online and certainly on the Mountaineer in Scotland uh, uh, website as well. But I don't think anything can take the place of, of going on a course and learning the skills from, you know, uh, someone who's, who's an expert in the field. I think that's the best way ahead. Um, which leads us nicely on to a question from Graham. What's the best way to practice navigation for whiteout conditions under simulation? Whoa, Graham. Perhaps we need to sort of invent this sort of white box. And, and if you get into difficulties, you kind of turn the light on or off or, or whatever. Because simulating nav in whiteout in winter, I just don't think you can. I mean, it's serious. It's really serious. And we run winter navigation courses which start at midday and go through till 10 o'clock at night and that's purely based on the fact that that's why people get into difficulties when it gets dark and there's snow on the ground and there's poor visibility above and white out to me and and gary might throw in a bit here is where you literally can't differentiate between the sky and the ground and that's when people get into difficulties walking over cornices for example but ali can you think of any way of actually simulating that without actually being out in it i mean i, I would say night navigation or actually navigating on the hill so i know a lot of people i would say kind of pretend to navigate so they do a bit with the map and then they pull their phone out to check where they are and I think every time you pull your phone out, you're kind of denying your brain a chance to learn something actually to do with navigation. So I would suggest to people actually navigate on the hill with your map and compass and put your phone away for emergencies. The only way I've seen whiteout navigation uh, being attempted to be taught is by putting a bucket over the head. That's actually how the, the British Antarctic Survey do it in a field in Derbyshire, bucket over the head with a compass sort of just uh, down here but I don't recommend it. It's not that great. No, and I think just be conservative. You know, the, the first place to practice walking on a bearing is not on the Cairngorm Plateau in a whiteout with snow on the ground and poor visibility. So, you know, if you're not confident about your navigation, then just choose some lower hills and stay below the cloud level. And if you get caught out, then having something called the OS, which is Ordnance Survey uh, Locate app, so that's OS Locate, will give you a six figure grid reference of your location, which can be really useful to then help you make decisions of how to get off the hill from the point you're at. But obviously that needs you having the knowledge of how to transfer that six figure grid reference onto your map. And um, if you have a look at the navigation pages on our website, it will explain how to do that. Now, here's a very random question from Terry. Is there a QR system that can be put in place at the bottom of the hills so it allows tourists and hill walkers to know more on the hill and links to the weather? Do you have a, a Mountain Weather Information Service app, Gary? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we do. Uh, we have one that's available for Android. We're hoping to get that up and running for all devices, but we would sort of direct you at the moment to the main website, which is responsive for all devices anyway, so you'd only get the same content. Um, that sounds like we're going even more high tech with that idea, but yeah, you, if, as long as you've got some phone signal, um, you'll get onto our content even in a fairly low resolution. Um, but yeah, there's an Android app, but hopefully a bit more than that uh, on its way. Yeah, and that answers uh, Nadia's question for, for sure. And, and another app, which is uh, a really useful download, a free download, is the B Avalanche Aware app. So BAA, and that will give you the avalanche forecast and weather information for the area that you are uh, visiting. So the B Avalanche Aware app is a really useful tool. And um, 
yeah, download it onto your phone as well as obviously do your research on the, the website on the evening prior to you heading out as well. Just finally on the QR code system at the bottom of a hill, I think, Terry, sorry, I, I just cannot see how, how that would work practically. It'd probably, you know, get washed away or covered in rime ice or, or whatever. So um, maybe something for the, uh, for the future. Sounds okay. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds, it sounds possible. If you had something at the popular areas that you could scan, I mean, you wouldn't want it everywhere. It does sound a possibility, but like you say, a bit futuristic, doesn't, yeah. A bit futuristic yeah. for me, I can tell you. <laughs> um, again from Alba, I've got good boots, but I'm not sure at what point I need to buy crampons and or an ice axe. Are you able to shine some light on when these become necessary? Ali, that is this perfect question for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think if you are planning to go to the bigger hills, uh, so the Monroes and things like that in Scotland in winter, really from now, uh, I would say it would be best to, to carry crampon and axes and know how to use them. Uh, there's obviously lots of lower level hills that don't get as much snow and you'd be able to get uh, that information from the weather forecast and stuff. But Really, if you're going to go up high, uh, it would be better to know how to use them and, and carry them with you. Nice one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in from Martin, tips for maintaining a fast and light approach to Scottish winter mountains. It's quite interesting that, isn't it? Because moving fast is actually sometimes a real safety thing when we've got you know short daylight hours and we're down with a huge rucksack and carrying a lot of equipment that is totally unnecessary it is not a good thing at all you're more likely to you know need Kirsty's assistance when it gets dark and you haven't got yourself off the hill but there's a real balance to be had isn't there between having enough kit and not having too much and and the bottom line for me is you know I want to know that I've got that sort of extra layer and that bivy bag just in case the unexpected happens and I'm stationary on the hill for a period of time waiting for help. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a fine balance. And, and, you know, spending lots of money on lighter weight kit, I think, is, is one thought about it as well. Um, well, uh, I, there's another MWIS question here, mountain weather question from Hannah. When it says cloud free Munros, and we all love it, Gary, when you put down cloud free Munros, all right, so keep it going. When it says that, is it based on cloud free blue sky days when it is a high percentage, or is it more based on visibility? It's visibility strictly because it's when you're having what we mean by cloud free Munros, it's in the cloud on the hills section of the forecast that we do. It's when the when the cloud is actually on the hills itself. So you're talking hill fog in that respect. So when we're giving our percentage, it's your chance of being in or out of fog when you're on the highest summits at Munro level, basically. So once you're above 900 metres, give or take, um, if we've given 10% chance, then really once you're at that level, your chances of being anything other than just thick fog is, is very slim. Um, we could have a day, of course, where you have a completely overcast sky, but the cloud base is up at, say, 1400 metres and above the summits where you, your sky is cloud laden um, but the summits are all clear so no it, it's not a blue sky it's not a percentage of what the sky is like it's whether you in fog on the hills itself so it's uh, it's that story rather than being blue sky as such but it's your chances of being in or out of, of fog for any length of time really if, if we're giving almost certain then those are the days that you want to, to be up on top Okay, lovely. Awesome. Hopefully that's <laughs> answered Hannah's question. And one in from Spencer. After acquiring some newfound winter mountaineering skills, what would be a recommendation for where to go? So let's pass that to Kirsty first of all. Kirsty's based down in Oban area. What would be a, a top tip for, for you, Kirsty? Which, which hill would you advise people as they're starting out? Um, starting out in winter, I think um, Glencoe's got some really great options. There's things like Bucolet Beg um, with the two minerals on the ridge there, but um, it's still a fairly a fairly straightforward and, and quick day. So, um, so if you're wanting to try out new, new skills, it's really good for early season when, you know, we've not been in crampons for like 
anywhere between six and nine months, depending on how good the last winter was. Um, just having a day that you know you can do and you can take some time and practice a few of your skills, something like that. Um, I guess over on the east, there's like you can do a, a loop round um, the northern quarries um, and, and those kinds of spots where it's kind of a shortish day that um it's fairly straightforward and you can just kind of play around with the skills yeah i think that that's good and if you're kind of new to the winter scene then being on terrain that is not too consequential so you know i always call the buccaletic bag in glencoe the people's mountain because it's so popular and you can certainly for the most part keep off sort of pretty steep gnarly ground but things that are kind of roly-poly and you know if you took a slip it, it wouldn't be too consequential so staying away from the kind of you know gnarlier peaks but but ali you're based a bit further north fort william way would be something local there you could recommend as a sort of starter starter mountain in winter um, I'm actually quite a big fan of the hills to the west of uh, Fort William, so the Corbett Street or um, the Monroes above Glenfinnan are really nice in winter. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, not huge days, but really once you're once you're away from that road out to Mali, they feel really quite remote, and they often yeah. get much uh, much lower winds actually than a lot of the Loch Aber hills like Ben Nevis and the Annex. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thought because wind is a significant factor for us in the winter, isn't it? And I think my top tip would be something off the A9 at Dramocta because you're already starting out at sort of 400 metres or higher and they're very roly-poly hills and um, as long as you're dropping off uh, vaguely in the right direction, you're going to hit a major road. So, you know, the navigation thing is, um, you know, perhaps not as challenging as in some areas, but but certainly, you know, all mountains will form cornices on them. And uh, just putting some thought into um, Gary's forecast, which ways there been the prevailing wind the last few days, where will the, the cornices have developed? And if the visibility is poor, you know, giving them a, a very wide berth and, uh, and of course, having a look at the Scottish Avalanche Information Service report for the area or the nearest area to the, the hills that you're looking at to make sure you've got a, a handle on, on what the avalanche conditions are like. And, um, you know, if uh, the avalanche conditions would never stop me going out, but it might um, affect the route choice that I make. So if I'm concerned about avalanche, I would definitely stick to ridges because they tend to be wind scoured and are much uh, less likely to, to get involved in avalanche. So um, moving on, there's so many questions coming in. It's hard to keep a track of it. Oh, Camilla, do you recommend having a group shelter bothy bag year round or just in the winter time? Is a group one preferred, in, even if you're hiking solo? So the clue's in the name, isn't it? You need more than one person for these things to work. But Kirsty's the expert on this. Tell us about group shelters. Um, so I, I, I always carry one in winter. Um, and if I'm out by myself or with a couple of people, I might not have a group shelter. I might have like, a, what are the, the silver blanket things? Blizzard. Yes, a blizzard bag, blizzard um, bag instead in summer, um, unless I'm with a group of people, in which case I'll take a group shelter. Um, if I would say even if you're out by yourself, you can get two man shelters, which um, would work really well because you can tuck them in well around you and, um, and keep you a wee bit cosier. Um, and within the mountain rescue team, we all individually carry a, a two man shelter. Um, when we're out on collapse. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Because of course they need the body heat to work, don't they? And if there's two yeah. of you in a two person shelter, then then they really work really well. But I, yeah. I would say I carry one all year round. And if it's just me and my pal out, then I've just got a wee tiny two person one. It, it weighs nothing. But you know, if I'm out with a group, it's something a bit more substantial. Um oh Ali. Jason's asking, what would be the best first course to go on for ski mountaineering? Uh, I might have to put that one back to you, actually, Heather. Oh, okay. You're probably better with the ski mountaineering stuff than me, I think. 
Yeah, I've definitely got an answer. There are various uh, uh, people who can help you here. Um, there's obviously the National Outdoor Centre, Glenmore Lodge, who run uh, intro to ski mountaineering courses. But there's also, oh, I've just spotted a badger outside the window getting distracted. He's called <laughs> Billy, by the way. Um, there are also various private providers, for example, a G2 in Aviemore and uh, an organisation in Aviemore called Cairngorm Guides, who all run... Um, beginners intro ski mountaineering and um and we also mountaineer in scotland run a ski mountaineering weekend but it's not for novices it's for people who take the lead role within clubs so they would already have their own kit and it's looking at uh kind of managing a group in that mountain environment so if you google um jason ski mountaineering cairngorms aviemore you, you'll get a few um options come up there and uh, I'm a very keen ski mountaineer and I'd say, yeah, go for it. Like you have some cracking days out ski mountaineering in Scotland. Um, Pete, what's the best tip to help walkers, hikers, et cetera, to help you all? Thank you all for your time. Very much appreciated. That wasn't the question, was it? Moving swiftly on to the next one. <gasps> Paul. What's the scariest situation you've been in in the Scottish hills? And at what point do you turn back? Ali? Uh, I think my scariest situation would be on Benaverd, so quite a remote Munro in the Cairngorms. And I was on my own getting ready for my winter mountain leader assessment. And I was on the summit in quite a high wind and I dropped my map. And uh, it was already quite late in the day. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was just very, very scary. <laughs> um, I did actually, uh, I dropped it and I did actually manage to chase it and grab it. Although in hindsight, I think I would have been better just leave, leaving it go. Uh, but yeah. Kirsty, have you got a, a wee epic to share with us? Well, that you're prepared to share. <laughs> I, I was trying to think and I, I don't know whether I just block out most of the scary things because I kept, no, no, like rushing to me. But there's been... Um, just like going out for a day's climbing on um, Benandoi in the northeast of Corrie in the Bridge of Rock Hills, um, which is quite a long walking as it is. And just kind of the whole, the whole Corrie was uh, unconsolidated and just trying to like make upwards progress was, was quite exciting. Um, so we, we traversed off and, and left the climbing and headed home. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had a similar experience going to do a winter route on Ben Starov and spent four hours kind of getting to within 100 metres of the base of the route and then deciding that it was really not a good place and turning round. But I guess uh, one of the most amusing incidents rather than scary was doing a big ski tour from the Lek to Cairngorm and not making it and not planning to spend the night out, but we did. And that was a bit of a chilly night huddled on a, a bench in a bothy with no sleeping bag or thermo rest or anything. Particularly unpleasant experience, to say the least. We had an early start the following day. Uh, moving on from the epics then. And Gary, we've got one here. Could you add a map to the MWIS site so you can see the areas? Some people don't know where the Monolia or Great Glen is. Oh, yeah, it's it's a common request actually. It's work in progress. So, quick answer. Yeah, we're uh, trying to build something of a mapping tool. In it's, uh, um, yeah, we, we try and describe them as well as we can. But yeah, naturally, there's still the people who don't know the areas. So yeah, work in progress. We'll be there. Okay, good. We're always uh, we're always open to some feedback, aren't we? And Claire Hills recommended for practicing axe and crampons. I think it goes back to those easier roly poly hills. You know, start off practicing your crampon and ice axe work in somewhere where if you blow it, then it is not consequential. You're not going to slide, you know, over some steep ground or just accelerate, you know, down a hillside. So, so find somewhere relatively straightforward um, and perhaps on some lower slopes of some mountains. Um, food. I like this. I'm always into the food thing. Ali, what food do you have in your bag for a day on the hill? Uh I guess for a winter day on the hill, well, first of all, I'd make sure I have a pretty decent breakfast. Uh, I quite like my breakfast, so that's pretty easy to do normally. And then uh, usually I would have a couple of sort of hearty sandwiches or wraps with lots of good filling, um, a couple of bars, maybe some, uh, some sort of uh, small snacks, so maybe sweets or nuts. Um, 
pork pies, anything that's sort of high calorie. Another thing I'm always quite careful to do is leave myself food in my vehicle. So I'll leave myself maybe a pack of hobnobs and a bottle of juice or something like that. So that as soon as I get back, I've got some food and stuff as well. Ali, you haven't mentioned the C word. Kirsty, I'm sure you would mention the, the C word if I asked you what you had in your rucksack in the winter. The cake. Well, that, yeah, cake and chocolate. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I usually go for um, like sandwiches, peanut butter sandwich usually. It's like quite stodgy, but it sticks to your ribs kind of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, a few bars. I you tend to um, always carry a couple of extra bars, a couple that I don't plan on eating. If for any reason I'm out a lot longer than I ex I'm expected, um, just so I've got something that could take me through the evening um, if I end up getting, getting back quite late at night or early hours of the morning. Yeah. I think stuff that's easily accessible and high energy and, you know, you're not worrying about the calories at this stage. You're worrying about not having enough calories. So, you know, I often have a, like a packet of uh, jelly snakes or something in my sort of outside pocket that I can snack on throughout the day. So, um, Gary, this might seem an odd question. Does MWIS tend to forecast slightly pessimistically to help us err on the side of making safe choices or not? It often seems that way and would be helpful to know. I would say yes, um, and that that's probably what we've always tended to do, again, for safety purposes, if nothing else. If there is the potential for <clears throat> very severe conditions coming in, even if the risk is maybe, say, two or three days away and, and it's, it's not a nailed uncertainty to happen, to put that in the forecast so that if somebody's about to set off on a few days expedition, um, you're aware that there's a bit of danger on the horizon. Um, mm -hmm. I would say the simple answer and the short answer to that is that, yes, a little bit on the pessimistic side, um, not to the extent that we're trying to put people off, but just as a sort of a warning is to say, well, we're trying to hit the message for people who maybe not as experienced mm -hmm. um, so that you're aware just how bad it could really be in that respect. It's not uh, to be, I suppose, underplaying how, how poor the conditions can deteriorate into. Um, normally, I suppose the pessimism will be just a highlighting of how severe conditions could be a few days out. Maybe as we get nearer to the event, once the confidence gets in there, you'll, we'll sort of flesh out the, the detail a little bit. But yeah, if, okay. if, if anything, perhaps just leans, leans on, the, on the pessimistic rather than the optimistic for safety purposes as much as anything. OK, that's a, a fair answer. And I'm just aware I've got one in here from Graham, and I don't have any experience with this, but Graham's asking, how do you rate OS Maps app in brackets live route? Uh, Graham has found it very accurate when walking in good biz doing Corbett. So Kirsty or Ali, have you got any experience of the OS Maps app? I've, I've not myself, no. Ali? Uh, no, no, neither, I'm afraid. Sorry, Graham, we're going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> not very helpful for you, sorry. Do apologise. Sounds like it's helpful, though. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it's useful, yes. I tend to stick with my good old-fashioned map and compass because I know I'm just going to be able to rely on it. And, um, right, trail running boots, ra oh, sorry, trail running shoes versus boots from Nadia. And she has put a caveat, probably not in winter. Have there been studies done on the likelihood of injury depending on footwear? And I'm going to chip in a little bit here, Nadia, if it's a, a lovely dry forecast and it's mainly on paths, then I'm definitely in some sort of trail running shoes. But if I'm heading over to the boggy West Coast and going off piece, then I'm definitely in my boots. But Kirsty, um, have you been involved with some rescues where that you can attribute the problem to the footwear? Um, probably more in terms of slips and slides occasionally. Um, in winter where you know you want a solid boot for cutting steps and that kind of thing um but in summer I, yeah i don't think so so long as your trail running shoes are are like trail running shoes and not just general trainers um they, they tend to cope not not too badly um and it's definitely my preference in summer yeah i think it's um 
you know, it very much depends where you're planning to go and what the weather's like and what the underfoot conditions are like, doesn't it? So it's uh, it's doing your homework before you go out, I think, that one. And, and Ali, back to you, because you did mention big breakfasts, yeah? Pauline yeah. says, do you think you get more energy if you eat big breakfast before the hike rather than stopping for lunch on the hill, which might make you tired? I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I saw that question come up. I'm not certain about lunch making me tired. I mean, I would go for both personally. Uh, my preference, I usually have some eggs or something like that in the morning. And like I said, you know, a couple of good sandwiches and some snacks. It is really important that you, you keep eating during the day. Yeah, uh, definitely. You've got that fuel to burn. And, and like Heather said there, I mean, basically it should just be stuff that, that you really want to eat. If you have it in your bag and you think, oh, I, I don't really fancy that, then it's the wrong food. Uh, you mm. need stuff that you want to eat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, question from Alexis. I'm not really sure who to pass this to. We do have a doctor in the house. So if he's listening up there, maybe he'll come down and help us with um, this lady who has problems with Raynard's disease in cold conditions. So um, Duncan, if you're listening upstairs, you might want to pop down and come and give us a bit of advice on that. Um, Pongo Bear, love the name. I've got my own bear behind here. Pongo Bear, is there an in-reach type device as used in the US for the UK? Yes, there is. There is a Garmin in-reach and there's a Garmin in-reach mini, which is like mini. It's kind of, that's not to scale, is it? Because I'm holding my hand out. It's about four centimeter squares, the Garmin in-reach mini, and they are available in... Uh, Tizo stores so uh, the answer is yes and of course it leads into the fact that of course there's many places in the Scottish mountains where you can't get uh, reception on your mobile phone um, you should have um, uh, your phone registered for the 999 emergency texting service if you don't know what that is then uh, we will send you a link to explain my colleagues behind the scenes will explain and um, so get your phone registered for, for the emergency SMS texting service. And um, there's places where that won't work either. So if you go out alone into remote places in the mountains, then you might want to think about some form of personal locator beacon or Garmin in reach, or there are spot locator beacons and, and they all have different functionality and cost varying amounts of money. So hopefully Pongo that has answered your question and we've now just brought a doctor into the house which is very convenient isn't it and we've got a question here for dr duncan here he is hello and the question alexis is do you have any advice or tips for people who suffer from reynard's conditions in cold conditions for example when it becomes really difficult and uncomfortable to try to use maps etc this puts me off hiking in the winter and it's a shame Yes, it is a shame, I would say, and don't let it put you off. I get it mildly in my fingers, just a little bit, but I know some people get it severely, and it can be quite difficult to manage. Um, I would say be very careful with your gloves. Uh, maybe spend a bit of money on it. Think through what gloves you're going to use for the conditions. Maybe have a dry pair or two even in your backpack and I know some people I think Rich Bentley said that one trip he had seven pairs of gloves on a an M Hill training um, so be really careful with your gloves um, if that's still not working there is a drug called nifedipine which is used for various cardiac conditions and if you ask your GP they may think it would be a good idea for you it really depends on all sorts of individual issues with yourself, what other illnesses you might have, et cetera. But nifedipine can be used on occasions in certain people just on the day that you're going to get your cold fingers, go climb, you can just take one tablet and it may greatly reduce how much trouble you have from it. Mm. Best of luck with it. Don't let it put you off. No. Thank you, uh, guest speaker, Dr. Duncan yeah. Gray, who just happened to be in the house, literally in the house. Um, Oh, we've got all these questions and we're not going to get through them all. Johnny, are you going to die if you do the Anarchy Gak Ridge? Possibly. <laughs> People do. 
got to be realistic and if you're doing it in windy conditions wet conditions uh snowy conditions if you don't have the right skills then it is a technical place and there's many places where a wee slip will result in uh something serious but don't let it put you off doing the monroes do it on a lovely dry day in the summer potentially hire a mountaineering instructor to take you along it or another option is to do the two monroes on the anakigat ridge in two separate days but it would be a shame to miss out on the main sort of meat of the ridge so think about potentially hiring a mountaineering instructor and my colleagues behind the scenes will send a post a link there to a page which gives you some advice on that Ooh, right uh, gary i want to make use of you because you're here and there's a weather question here in for spence from spencer i like to try to predict weather using the pressure charts first and um, you might want to explain what they are, but the UK can get some really complex weather patterns. Yes, it can. And any recommendations for resources to interpret UK weather systems specifically with examples? How much time we got? <laughs> <laughs> Not long. Uh, no. <laughs> um, pressure charts, basically, well, that's the surface pressure charts, the isobars that you'll see, you know, your standard synoptic charts, if you're familiar with any sort of weather maps, you see them on the TV as well. That's just the, um, the weather patterns moving around, high pressure being good weather, basically, and low pressure being bad, to, in a nutshell, sum that one up. Um, complex weather patterns, yeah, you're telling us that sometimes they'll give us the runaround in terms of what they're going to do more than a day or so ahead. The simplest ones are when things are coming in as a steady westerly from the Atlantic. Those are the um, easiest ones to deal with from a forecasting point of view to sort of see where the progression of that weather uh, is going a few days down the line. Um, best suggestion perhaps is if you do a bit of a, a read up on air masses, um, which will give you a, a good feel for British weather patterns. Um, it's really, I suppose, that the rule of looking at any wind direction, which way the wind is blowing and where the air is coming from. So where the air has come from to get to Britain is crucial as to what weather we get. If it's come up from the subtropics, uh, mild and damp and full of low cloud, if it's come down from polar regions, um, generally bright and breezy and showery. So there's certain weather types that go with certain wind directions. So, And that's what we sort of mean by air masses, um, just characteristic bodies of air that move towards Britain. So um, have a read up on that. Um, in terms of resources, um, to look at a, a wealth of technical charts, a website such as Weather Online, uh, weatheronline.co.uk, um, go to expert charts on there, you'll be blinded by a, a sea of model data and lots of complexity um, that you probably need a, a halfway to a degree to understand, but um, you'll get a feel for what's sort of going on. Um, in terms of any other examples, there'd be a, a variety of books or um, online resources. I suppose I could plug at any any number. Um, there's the Mount uh, the Mountain Forecasting Handbook. I believe David Pedgley, correct me if I'm wrong, is a very good book for um, mountain weather general weather. Uh, one of my colleagues, Simon Keeling, has got some very good books and D a DVD with just general um, sort of basic level weather forecasting you might want to have a google search for if i'm not plugging too heavily um but yeah in terms of just the trying to analyze the pressure charts that's what we're doing day in day out and if you can just get that feel for where the air has come from um that gives you a, a big story of what the weather is that we're going to get so much so much variability that's lovely thank you gary um moving on kerry how many days prior to your day out um, when you've had lots of snow, or indeed any time I would say in the winter, do you look at the avalanche forecast to get a good idea of what's going on? I would say, Kerry, at least two or three days out and make sure you have a look at the blogs, the forecaster blogs on the right hand side of the home page on the Scottish Avalanche Information Service, uh, because that will give you a good pictorial um, indication of, of where the snow is and where the snow isn't. Snow is inherently a very complex science and um, if you're quite an experienced uh, person in winter and you want a bit more on avalanche then we do run one day avalanche awareness courses here in the Cairngorm so take a look at that in fact the spaces on those courses and our winter skills and winter navigation courses so take a look at our website if you're interested in any very um, accessible priced training 
Um, looking at this, Sarah, I'm a complete beginner. What should I learn and do before walking in the hills? So, Ali, I think uh, I'm going to pass that one to you. A complete beginner. What would uh, a few top tips for that? Um, yeah, so it might be worth looking to see what clubs were in, in your area, Sarah. Uh, clubs can often help you uh, join a group for the day, go out and gain more experience. Um, and uh, or, or perhaps go on one of the mountaineering Scotland courses. Uh, I'd particularly focus on at least sort of learning how to navigate um, and getting advice on sort of best places to go and stuff like that to start with. Cool, excellent. Yeah, and there's some really good information on our website as well if you just start now with regards to, you know, appropriate kit that you need to take as well. But, you know, don't be too ambitious. Baby steps first, I would say. Uh, Jason here, um, it's 15 years since you've ice climbed, shame on you Jason. Is there such a thing as a refresher course or should I just go on a beginner course? I think my advice to Jason would probably be to um, have a look at the link that we are putting up or have put up for the Association of Mountaineering Instructor members and uh, sign up for a day and then they can do a bespoke course just for your needs rather than you starting at, at the beginning. So I would uh, hire a mountaineer instructor for, for the day to, to look at your skills and help you out there and, and do a wee refresher. Um, Pete Martin, map first, of course, then GPS. What phone app is the best to use? Kirsty, what which phone app do you use? Um, I've used View Ranger. Um, I bet View Ranger is pretty good. Um, but if you're happy using Map and Compass and that kind of thing, OS Locate, which is the Ordnance Survey app, which Heather mentioned earlier, is um is really handy just for just for relocating your you. And then you can get back onto using the map and compass, which which is probably if you if you're good at navigating, that's going to be your most solid. Um, yeah. I always think of that OS locate as a bit of my get out of jail free card. If I'm not sure, I can just bang it on and get a six figure grid reference. Yeah, that and slope aspect, but that's going into something we haven't got time for tonight. Uh, Pete Martin, root cars, does anyone use them anymore? I think the safe answer there is absolutely no, Pete, unless you're going through your gold D of E. But it's a really important point because what I do do when I'm out on the hill is make sure that someone knows where I'm going. And that might be just like a text to, to Dr. Duncan or my work colleague. And, you know, we, we clock in and out with each other to make sure that, you know, someone knows roughly where you've gone and when you should be back. And ticks, are they about in winter? Yes, is my uh, quick answer to that. Ali, do you want to add anything in? Ticks are definitely, I've had ticks in February. I've had ticks in November. Yeah. I guess I'm usually above the snow line as soon as uh, winter hits. So I don't seem to get as many. So I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Depends if you're a dog owner, I think, as well. You definitely get more if you're a dog owner. Uh, from Alistair, question for Kirsty. Um, I've always thought about joining my local mountain rescue team, but unsure just how much experience is needed and just how tying it is. Um, yeah, so I think it, it depends which team your local team is. Uh, each team has a different way of um, a different application process, basically. Um, here in Oban, we invite people, uh, well, we find out a little bit about them and their background and we invite them for a day out or on one of our trainings so we get to know them a little bit. Other teams might do it differently um, and be looking for different experience, I think, as well. It depends on where the team is based. Um, in teams in areas where there's, there's really mountainous technical terrain, might be looking for people who are maybe climbers or um, just pretty handy on steep technical ground. Um, maybe teams that cover more lowland areas are just looking for people who can be out on the hill um, for quite a long time carrying heavy bags because that's what a lot of it is. Um, so yeah, I would say basically just get in touch with your team uh, or your local team and kind of find out what the process is for them. Um, and some teams will have a set number of trainings and call outs they want you to attend. Others might be a bit more flexible, again, depending on, on where you are. Um, so yeah, it's very individual to the, to the team. Yeah, and of course, you know, once you join the 
team as you know often you join with teams as probationer you do get the opportunity for for lots of training uh, you don't have to be an expert mountain rescue before you start you just need to be fit keen and enthusiastic and and have the time to do it um we're going to draw it to a close very shortly guys but whilst we're on the subject of mountain rescue just um for those people who are starting out you know if you're in a situation where you can't get yourself off the hill and, and self-help then it's uh, really um important that you understand that to get professional help you need to dial 999 or 112 and ask for police and then mountain rescue um final question i'm going to take before we uh, call it a day just because it's caught my eye <laughs> Uh, Max, what type of dog do mountaineering Scotland suggest? That's a very random question because we have no idea what you're actually talking about. Are we talking about a dog for the snow in winter? Um, who knows? Probably not a chihuahua or one that fits in a handbag. Something that's a bit more sort of um, robust. And certainly um, I trained a search and rescue dog, which was a, a collie and um they're certainly incredibly resilient in the Scottish mountains in winter. But ironically, we're just going live shortly with a whole page about dogs in the mountains. And my colleagues behind the scene will uh, put up a link for that for those people who are interested in anything to do with four legged doggies. So I'd like to uh, call it a, a, a day or evening here. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Ali and Gary and Kirsty for uh, sharing their time with us this evening but also behind the scenes to make this happen because we're all pretty useless it up front here is uh, my colleague neil and helen from mountaineer in scotland so i'd really like to uh, pass a big thank you through to them as well and um hopefully we'll see some of you out on the hill this uh, winter on one of those lovely blue sky days gary like that picture behind you and um yeah enjoy the hills folks and stay safe Bye-bye.